You're listening to the Teak Nation Podcast, where we strive to educate, inspire, and entertain you with tips and lessons from frauders and friends of TKE. Hello, Teak Nation Podcast. Alex Swinson, Donnie Aldrich here with you. As per usual, we are once again on location. Very exciting. Happy to be in the great Northeast, Boston, Massachusetts, one of my favorite cities as a lifelong Red Sox fan, uh, not as a lifelong Patriots hater, not a big Red or a big Boston guy in that sense. But regardless, uh, we are excited to be here. We're, we're out here for a grand council meeting. and We have with us a very distinguished guest today, Frauder Bruce B. Melchert. Uh, we could fill up an entire episode with Bruce's accomplishments in the fraternity. He is a past CEO, a past Grand Prix, an international founder, Order of the Golden Eagle. National expansion leader. National, yeah. Anything else you want, anything you want to throw in there, Bruce? Uh, that's about enough. Right, that order, order, that yeah. That's already way you down. Night of Apollo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bruce, first and foremost, is this your first podcast? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, it is. Well, we're, yeah. we're, we're honored. Looking um, forward. So we're, we're very excited. As we mentioned, for those who have been a part of this fraternity for long enough, I'm sure if you've not had the privilege of meeting Frater Bruce, you've at least heard of him. Bruce, I want to start with a pretty big picture question for you. Of all of your accomplishments in Talk at Metzl and everything that you've done in this fraternity, what are you most proud of? What stands out to you if, right, if, if you threw away every other title, award, everything else, what's the one thing that you would hold on to as, uh, as the most important to you? The most important thing, I think, is the number of men that I've heard. I've been honored to uh, pledge and uh, and to uh, initiate, and because uh, that was always sort of uh, my my uh, bread and butter. Uh, I remember one time going down to, in Houston, and uh, the, the teak house at the Houston on the Houston's campus was actually a former house of prostitution. But that's it's separate. That's getting right into it. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Different type of recruiting. Yeah. But well, there was a, we were at the teak office or, or had a teak party for, for rushing, and um, we went over to I went over to the Pike A house and uh, where they were having a rush party, and I talked three guys into coming over to the teak house. <laughs> which we were actually pledged them, uh, but and the way to do that was that I. Uh, uh, sort of played it uh, quiet. I got a pledge pin for a Pike A pledge pin on. So <laughs> that's how we got this guy. So that's, that's one of the things I like to do. The other is, uh, of course, uh, when I was working for the fraternity uh, and uh, was in uh, Canada uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to get the University of Manitoba as our first mm-hmm. teach chapter. And uh, that's a that's a really great story because it helped make us international and it was a great group for a long time. We still I still have close friends from that early those early days. So many of the stories that that are passed down to to men like us who currently work for the fraternity is about you standing on tables and the excitement and energy level that you have for recruitment and as you spoke, finding men from all over the, North America to join Talk Hap Epsilon. Where does that passion and love, Bruce, come from to want to spread that gift and further get more men into our organization? Well, if we have a good thing, you want to make it better and you want to add to it and you want a lot of people to be included in, and involved with it. Uh, it's not an exclusive club. You know, we have, uh, enjoy having a large number of outstanding people working. And that's so that was my motivation always and and both in rushing, adding number of uh, number of chapters, and also adding number of men to each of the chapters. Well, and I love the fact that you said that because when we go out on the road as a staff today, that's the same message we we spread, right? Whether it was fifty years ago, thirty years ago, a hundred years ago, you you still rush the same way by sharing stories, by sharing passion, by sharing excitement for the fraternity, and wanting to bring other people into this thing. That you hold so dear. So I, I, I love that you you brought that up and, and said that because I think it's just as relevant today as it's ever been. Absolutely. Um, you're someone who has seen the highest of highs with Teak, and for better or worse, some of the lowest of lows throughout your time. Whether it was as CEO, as Grand Preetness, as 
somebody who stayed involved running the nominations committee at, at Conclave. And, and I want to touch on both those things because I think there's lessons to be learned from both of them. When you think back on, on your entire TEAK experience with the Grand Council, with the staff, what high or highs are you most proud of? And what lows do you look back on and say, wow, A, can't believe we made it out of that, but B, here are some lessons that I've learned and carried with me throughout my life. Well, I'll start with the lows. Yes. I think maybe the lowest time was we had, I think, 13 staff members ready to go on the road. And uh, that's when the Russians moved in and, they, and, the, and the Berlin airlift started. And by the, before the end of the semester, uh, they uh, were all gone. They were all drafted. Uh, <laughs> so, so that was a very low. And, uh, and I, that's when I really went on the road. Um, I was in law school at that time. That's why I threw the books away and went and went on the road to visit chapters. That's probably one of the low times. Um, the highs are always when when you add new chapters, and it's always when you when you hear the number of new froggers that have been been added, or the number of new plenties who've been added to the chapter. Uh, those are the highs, and. Uh, and that's, that was always in competition with our with our fraternal friends, but uh, and you like to beat them from time to time. <laughs> you know, it's competition. That's part of what the idea. So awesome. So one of those highs you talked about was the University of Manitoba. Can you talk about that experience? Because I don't know that that's a story that has been shared very often. Of how did that come to fruition? from all, the interest of Teak or yourself and being a leader of that aspect. I know there's some other national expansion leaders, but what was the thought process to, to garner a group in Canada? Bill Hall was the executive director at that time, and I was on the staff. And I was in the state of Florida, and I was in Tampa, and it was a weekend, and I made a mistake of calling Bill Hall in Kansas City, where the headquarters was at that time. Uh, and because I had a whole weekend to go down to Miami and uh, and enjoy the sunshine and the warmth, um, <laughs> this was in uh, in January. Um, Bill was a great big guy. He had a hand span uh, that was uh, several inches, and he had a map of of paternity or uh, not paternity of colleges and universities on the wall next to it. And it's not a very large map, but it covered a lot of organizations. And I said, hey, hey gosh, I've got the whole weekend, to, to, you know, because I'm headed down to Miami. And he said, no, nah, I want you to go to the University of Manitoba, Canada. And I said, where the hell is that? And, and, why, and why are we doing that? It's, it's snowing up there. So anyway, he said, well, it's just two hand spans <laughs> <laughs> on his map. So I said, well, okay. So I got in the car and I started driving and I went through Kansas City uh, and at the headquarters. And then I went on to Manitoba, Canada. And sure enough, you could drive down the streets at that time uh, with the snow on both sides. Of, couldn't see over, you know. And so in the first weekend I got there, or it, it snowed more. Uh, and, uh, and so I got, I just holed up in the motel. But later on, I get acquainted with, uh, with some, some young guys, some guys, and a couple of their advisors. And they were very uh, kind of interested. And this one professor who was a, math, a mathematics professor, and he, also astronomy and so on. And he was a kind of a magnet on campus. And so I got sort of invited to myself to, to attend their little party. And uh, it was just a regular party and they did look at the stars and that sort of thing. And then we started talking about fraternity. And, uh, and uh, so uh, the advisor said, well, you know, we're not much interested in that here and so forth. And uh, I said, well, just let me talk to some of the guys and so forth. So that's where I met Brian McPherson and several other guys. And those were very compatible guys. They were high education, high interest levels, and so on. And by the time that I was there, about three or four days, and kept growing the group, and uh, uh, 
they, um, then, the, then the professor said to me, you know, maybe that's a good idea. I'll just be their advisor. And so that's how, that's how it happened. And, and, and it uh, was uh, felt good. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth the uh, 24 inches of snow that you uh, exactly. <laughs> I have I have to ask. You said it was two hand spans for for the executive director at the time. How many hand spans was it for for you on a <laughs> Well, that probably about four or five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I want to talk about people because that's that's what makes this fraternity so special are, are the people that are in it. And when we think about, right, some of the biggest names of Tall Cap Epsilon, the historical figures, obviously you're on that list. You might not think you are, but you are. Um, R.C. Williams, right? Charles Wall Green, Ronald Reagan. These are individuals. Even some of the founders, you, Bruce, you, did you no, know? No, I never you met any of the okay. founders. Never but these, these are guys who you right, had an opportunity, uh, opportunities that very few other people had to interact with them. Yep. Who... It doesn't just have to be contained to that list, but who in this fraternity have, have you met that has made the biggest impact on you? Somebody that you look back on and say, I'm really fortunate, really blessed to have been able to spend time with this one person or these few people. Oh boy, that goes, that does go back a while. Well, you definitely got to meet a president of the United States. Well, exactly, right. Uh, and that was, we all went to the White House for lunch and he said, you know, I just, it's great to have a few of the boys over the house for lunch, you know, I can comment. <laughs> and then I met him on several occasions um, when he was campaigning and I was involved politically. And so uh, I, I was on the plane with him on a couple of occasions and he just told one funny story after another, you know, he was a real, uh, real humorous and fun loving guy. And uh, we were talking earlier about uh, being able to get generate the kind of enthusiasm from undergraduates to support a political campaign, for instance. There were several of those uh, activities and several chapters were very supportive with Ronald Reagan during when he ran for, for the presidency of the United States. Um, I suppose uh, I, well, there, were, there were several one, several big people, Jim Logan, James C. Logan, uh, was a Grand Preakness of, uh, when I was an undergraduate, and the conclave was held in in uh, Kansas City, and uh, I was at the University of Missouri at Columbia, and and so he, he asked me to come up and to the conclave and organize a bunch of undergraduates to support him for Grand Preakness, and I was uh, also on the nominations committee. <laughs> I haven't been there ever since. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know, but, uh, didn't know the long-term commitment you were signing up for that day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and but Jim Logan was the one that uh, so all of the people in in Illinois in those days, that is the old alums and so on, um, uh, were very unhappy that they moved the moved the headquarters to Kansas City from from uh, uh, Illinois. Uh, and they, uh, th during that uh, campaign, they were sending packets of dirt uh, for, from Illinois, <laughs> from Champaign, Illinois, to Kansas City. Uh, and, but Logan was farsighted, and he was on the phone all the time. He was a very activist, uh, Grand Brickness. And he was not only was uh, they call executive director, but the Grand Prix was on was you were calling directly with the Grand Prix at that point in time. He was directing things, and he's the one that really instilled the interest of of building TKE and of starting up of all things on teachers' college campuses, <laughs> and. Uh, which now, are, you know, was a that's a bulk of a yeah. lot of our of our organization uh, today. So I would say that Logan is one of the big ones. Uh, another one is uh, Don Kayser was was Grand Britness. Um He was from Epsilon chapter and uh, was the big leader there, and he provided a lot of a lot of stability to the organization. It was in the construction business. His sons also went to the Teaks. Joined the fraternity. Uh, at, yeah, at, through there. Uh, the Russ Salisbury, well, out of, from Kansas City, 
was uh, one of the big leaders of those times, highly, highly recognized, highly, uh, but was qu quite religious, but uh, a, a, a real rock solid kind of guy. So those are some of the people that, uh, that I looked up to and learned from and, uh, and developed my uh, instincts and talents from. I really appreciate you sharing that. I, another aspect that you, you mentioned is the headquarters moving to Kansas City. I believe you were part of more than one headquarters move during your, during your career. Most folks don't even know that the headquarters at one point was in Kansas City. Can you talk about the experience of moving headquarters and how eventually we ended up in Indianapolis? Because that's part of your history as well. Well, the, the, the headquarters was in Champaign, Illinois. And that's where everybody thought it would always be. And there was an, uh, there was an assistant dean of students who was the part of the exec of, of T. Um, I met him once, but when Jim Logan was elected, he decided to move, move it to Kansas City. And he had some uh, Alex Barkat, who was a big money guy in Kansas City, and he promised to build a headquarters. So when I started on the road as a staff guy, uh, Dick Hall was the exec, and, I, and there were about seven of us, I think, who were hired. And, we're, and the moving vans came in to Champaign, Illinois, and the staff in Illinois, or whoever, uh, just dumped all of the, emptied all of the chairs and, the, and all of the tables and all of the... Uh, the drawers and, and barrels, and the movers moved to moved Kansas City. And, and this, uh, this temporary headquarters was a kind of a barn. It didn't even, in some cases, didn't have uh, concrete floors for it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, and we called it El Rancho. And so we spent uh, all of our training uh, uh, opening up and, and and filling up boxes and, you know, uh, starting staff. Rebuilding an office. office. And rebuilding the office, building an office. And so it stayed in Kansas City then for several years. Um, when Dick Hall left, uh, I was uh, involved. Um, I, was, I was going to law school, University of Missouri in Kansas City. And the... Uh, Council called me from home during a board and they have a council meeting and said, would you come down to the hotel, the Mulebach Hotel? And I said, okay. And uh, uh, so uh, the upshot of it is that, uh, that Dick Hall uh, was left, uh, blessed, left, and they asked me if I would uh, take over. And so that's how I ended up being selected as, as the executive director at that time. Uh, uh, so we then, uh, a few years later, I'm trying to think of the dates, that we moved to the headquarters to Kansas City. Duke Flyad, who was the longtime executive director of Lambda Chi Alpha, and Delta, Delta, and several other organizations were in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, we had a council meeting in, in Indianapolis and at Duke's request, and he was uh, uh, kind of a recruiter, if you please. And part of it was because of tax exemption for fraternity organizations due to the national headquarters of the American Legion being in Indiana. Uh, and, and so that was a, uh, like a January uh, uh, council meeting. And that's when they decided to move it. So I said, well, I, that's fine. I'll, uh, I'll move you, but I'll move to headquarters, but I will, but I'm going to law school. Right. And, and uh, so the upshot of it is uh, that, uh, we moved to, to uh, Indianapolis uh, like in May. And then we had a conclave in Miami, Miami Beach, uh, in August. So that was hiring the staff, building, a, adding an addition to the building, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and then running, a, and then running <laughs> the conclave in Miami Beach. So that uh, took up some time. 
And that's how we got the new house. That's great. And then we on the, the building still stands. It's on uh, 3755 Washington Boulevard, just 38 in Washington Boulevard. Uh, and then a few years later, uh, I uh, uh, initiated uh, building a new headquarters uh, out in College Park. And that the ideal there was that there were other fraternities who were interested in, in moving in the College Park, even some thinking about sharing uh, services such as printing and computers and that sort of thing. Most of that didn't really happen, but the U and, uh, and, and fraternities and sororities moved to Indianapolis. And that was part of the attraction uh, to Indiana because uh, within roughly 500 mile radius of Indianapolis, there's two thirds of the college population. Right. And it makes a lot of sense. And that's why a lot of other fraternities and sororities have moved their headquarters there too. That's great. Another aspect that I wanted to, we talk about fraternity a lot, or family a lot in the fraternity, a lot about family. I would love for you to talk about your wife, Jeannie, and how she has become an icon, who she is, but how she has become so ingrained in the fraternity because Bruce Meldred is a legend in TKE, but also Jeannie is a big part of that story as well. And the support that she's given you personally inside the fraternity to be able to do all the things you've done, you have to have that support at home. Can you talk a little bit about your wonderful Jeannie? Well, uh, she's a very active uh, and has been very active in Alpha Chi Omega. Alpha Chi Omega sorority. Uh, Jeannie went to Butler University and was an Alpha Chi there. And she has, we have two daughters that were that are Alpha Chi's at IU. And uh, <laughs> so it seems like, uh, and then one, and also granddaughters that are Alpha Chi's. You can see the legacy uh, runs uh, pretty deep in our family. Uh, she's been uh, a partner in our relationships and, and she's always at conclaves and always uh, hosts uh, groups and, is, uh, and, and gives me a, lot, a long leash in order to do the things I do as well, which is, uh, is great. The other, you talk about uh, great uh, wives and things. I haven't mentioned Wenwood Cochran. Mm -hmm. Wenwood Cochran and his wife, Jean, um, uh, she was, uh, start, they started a, uh, an organization just sort of recognizing women who were great, you know, who were very supportive of their husbands and, and supportive of the fraternity. And, and so we, I can't stop without saying that Lenwood Cochran is probably one of my closest friends in the fraternity. And we used to go to Myrtle Beach every every summer with our families and uh, uh, and part and party together and that sort of thing. And uh, and and he was provided a great deal of leadership throughout the, his lifetime. And Lin, for the, for our listeners, Linwood is a former past Grand Prix. And unfortunately, we lost. Linwood and Angie in the last year. Right. If you attend Conclave, have attended Conclave or do attend Conclave, you'll see the Gene Cochran Award presented, which to your yeah. point, Bruce, is a is a way to celebrate those those spouses that have been so supportive to the fraternity because it really is a family, it's a family deal that that a lot of spouses sign up for when their husbands are so engaged and involved in the leadership of the fraternity. Exactly. Can you as we wrap up, can you if you have a message to share to TK, that's a great thing. You've been on many platforms in your life and had an opportunity to talk to the membership. This is another opportunity through the medium of podcasts. What's a message you would share with the membership, either our alumni or our collegiate members who are tuning in to this episode? You know, you, Teak to me is a, a, is a, a way of life. It's, a, it's something that gets in your blood uh, it's the people you know and the people you meet and the people who helped you, the people who contributed to your way of life and, and, and the kind of principles and things that we espouse that are men for a better world. Um, that's the kind of thing I think that is ingrained in me. I, I can't not be involved and, and talk up Epsilon. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to do this episode. 
even more so publicly want to thank you for how much mentor and support you've given to me personally. You know, most people don't know or see, but Bruce still continues to be engaged. Someone we have lunch together, try to do it every six or eight weeks and, and have conversations, but always continue to check in, always continuing to push me. How can we further recruitment, right? How can we, what are new campuses we're going to? And always someone who is just fueling, how can we advance the mission? How can we be a bigger fraternity? How can we be a better fraternity? And always pressing that upon me and anyone else that you engage. And so on behalf of the fraternity, thank you is nowhere near enough, but thank you for all that you have done and all you continue to do. It's my pleasure. I'm, it's, it's ingrained in me. And uh, thanks for the job you're doing, Donnie. It's okay. in providing the leadership that you have. Uh, that's in the grand tradition of, of execs uh, for TKE. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. And that'll do it for another episode of the Teak Nation podcast. Thank you for listening. A true honor to have Bruce Melcher joining us this week. And hopefully you enjoyed it as much as Donnie and I did. Make sure you hammer that like button. You subscribe. You follow. Follow Teak on Instagram. Follow Teak on Facebook. Anywhere that you need to make sure that you are to hear when the latest episode of the Teak Nation podcast drops. For Donnie Aldrich, I'm Alex Swinson. We'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you.